first of all, congratulations to those of you who've just gotten in and those of you who are just getting out. And, they don't uh, ever get out. Exactly. Well, yeah. <laughs> Let me just get exactly. one thing clear. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the Marines. Just, of, just in uh, case you were wondering. Of, um, it's a great question. You know, I, one thing that I think about as you ask it is the extraordinary change in status in our era of mm. outsiders um, or of insider outsiders. Um, there have always been people who didn't fit. Um, there have always, you know, people have always, even in the most traditional societies, 500 years ago, people slept with the wrong people occasionally, and there were, you know, bastard children, and there were um, people who didn't fit in any number of other ways, and those people were always the castaways of society, um, and you know, you had. I was struck reading this Amitav Ghosh book at, you know, about the 19th century seafaring world. And mm. like, this is one of these only places where you had all these mixed race people because they went from port to port. And, you know, and I think the crazy thing in our time is these people of multiple perspective have gone from being the castaways of society to the leaders. Um, yesterday, I had the opportunity to be in a, the first taping of Trevor Noah's new Daily Show. It was a test show, but it was the first test show he's done. You, you all probably, some of you heard of this. He's a South African comedian who really no one knew in America. He was, he was quite big in other countries, like a lot of things, but no one knew about him here. Um, and this is a South African who did this whole show, started with the Syrian crisis, talked about how horrible a place Hungary is behaving like right now talked about how amazing a place Germany is behaving, made the inevitable joke that you know it's a bad situation where people want to be taking trains into Germany to go to camps, um, and then that's a, that's sang, a bad a, joke. sang a poem in German, which he's one of the nine languages he speaks, sang a poem in German to thank the German people for being the only leaders in Europe right now. And I looked at my wife, Priya, some of you know, who's, who's biracial and born in Zimbabwe, and, and Priya, Priya said, you know, I feel like this is the first time our America has been on a stage like this. Um, so I think we're living at an amazing moment that honors the power of the outsider. And I think that power, you know, implied in your question, is the power to just look at things freshly. You know, I, um, and I was very, I tried when I wrote the India book not to, um, I didn't want to write the know-it-all book or attempt to write the know-it-all book. I wanted to figure out how do you take unique advantage of not knowing, um, because there is a power in not knowing, and there's a power in um, there's a power in things being fresh to you. Um, and I look at whether it's President Obama or Trevor Noah or any number of the, the literature, the number of people who are cross-cultural authors who write fiction now. Um, the castaways are now the voices we actually like to hear most loudly, and I think that's actually one of the great things happening in the world. And do you think that? for the first time in history you have a comparative advantage growing up as an outsider or at least perceiving yourself as an outsider yeah, I mean, as I a think, leader? I think that's the case. I think, I think it's also the case that there are still a large number of these people who are very poor and who are treated horribly in between these countries and if you're a Latvian in Russia it's still a problem. Um, but um, I think there's an opportunity for um, people who see duality to be to really play a very special role in, in this age of um, complete misunderstanding of the world. I mean, I have a, a friend who's half German and half Egyptian. And to watch her, you know, constantly pivot in her mind between these, the society of intense order and the society of loving chaos, and, th and the way she's able to hold both gives her a power in seeing the world. Just to cite one example of one person that really, you just imagine in any boardroom, any situation, any fellowship you'd throw her into would just be, make her immensely powerful relative to someone died in kind of one world. So I didn't think I was going to go in this direction, but... Um, this always happens with us. This right? always happens with us. <laughs> um, the, when I read The True American, which I cannot recommend highly enough to everyone in this room, um, but Tool described it at high level, um, uh, white meth head uh, who decides his gift to the American people after 9-11 is to kill Arabs, having never seen an Arab, goes after South Asians, and um, is effective with two misses, 
shoots the third Bangladeshi immigrant who ends up pleading for mercy using Sharia law while the guy's on death row. It's a true American story. Um, the imagination, the empathy, the love with which you sh shared that story was extraordinary. When I read that, Anna, when I'm listening to your words here, when I read the, and then saw, the Aspen speech, this idea of duality, of separation, I wonder how connected it, it is from both the, the policy level as well as the spiritual level to what you're seeing with inequality and capitalism as it is now. Do we just, is it too separate and what do we need to do as a world to make it more integrated? What is what separate? Capitalism and, and, the, and inequality. Yeah. I mean, I think part of, part of the problem is um, that I think we, if you, if you kind of step back and look historically, we live in these very big swings. And so right now we're in a very market loving swing, right? And up to kind of Thatcher and Reagan, you could say we were in a very market hating swing. Um, and each of these swings is kind of excessive. Um, and I think if you're the kind of person who always thinks the same idea, regardless of what swing you're in, then you're a crazy person. Um, but I think if you don't recognize that sometimes you're in an era with a consensus that is breaking, um, it's also problematic. So right now, I would say we are in um, an era in part because of the Cold War and how it kind of ended in a, a one-sided victory, um, in part because of globalization, in part because of India and China coming onto the capitalist stream and loving it and making a lot of money for everybody and themselves. We're in a moment where there's not a really great outsider opposition to capitalism. There's not a smart opposition to it. Um, and so you see different manifestations of that which is Scotland trying to become its own country, which is not a practical thing, but is some sort of visceral, like, get me out of this thing. And then you see Greece doing what it did, another kind of tanking into the ground. You see this guy who just won in Britain. Jeremy Corbyn. Who's probably not like a, like a practical vote of who people want to lead Britain, but it's some kind of like, you know, screw you vote. Um, you see, Bernie Sanders here, who is le probably less of a crazy figure than Jeremy Corbyn, but, but uh, by American standards, to have a declared socialist polling, as he, like there's something going on where pretty significant numbers of people, and if you look at the Bernie Sanders crowds, these are not like radical leftists. This is like middle America showing up. But is it a generational divide? When I look at the young leaders and where they are, I don't feel that they're sitting in the midst of, it's all about the market. I, I mean, I, it, it did, so no one says it's all about the market, but the way these consensuses work is um, that people who seem to disagree actually share underlying premises that they don't question. Um, so you have Hillary Clinton who's running on a pretty strong, just to stay with the politics example, pretty strong you know, to the left of her 2008 campaign. You have Jeb Bush, right? Um, if you look at their underlying view of how much the market and capitalism today needs to be reined in. Their real deep underlying view, it's not that different. When Hillary makes $100 million in 10 years after office, it's hard to believe that she really has a, a fundamentally different view in her gut of the propriety of this system. But and so a lot of the people working on the great causes of the world and on poverty, whatever, are still, although they're in a different place on that spectrum, the entire spectrum is kind of within the safe confines of not questioning the market motive. But let me push a little bit that, that in many ways, at the same time that this may be correct, at the same time, the world has, has never talked more about inequality. We're thinking about inequality in a very deep way. I would argue that every one of these fellows has come to Acumen to dedicate a year of their lives both to look at new economic models in old industries often, where they don't have a lot of wiggle room to try to take the tools of capitalism to extend it into the future. Uh, hard to do. And so, in a way, by, is it almost a distraction that we talk about Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton? There's another whole conversation going yeah. on. When I look at even Syria, 
the government policymakers aren't doing a very good job. Individual citizens, their generation, your, our generation of young people at Acumen, and as, as metaphor, are taking action in a different way, creating new kinds of systems. And what is, how does that fit in? What are you I, seeing in the I world? I agree. So I, I fully agree with that. And I think whether it's, you know, this kind of peer-to-peer -peer things or there's a whole bunch of models being invented within business, within kind of the aid world that are new models that are great. And we were just talking about Impesa a moment ago. I mean, there's no question that there's great stuff happening within that system, right? But you look at the Syria thing and you say, you know, the Germans decided by, you know, the flip of a, the signing of a pen to accept 800,000 people. That's a lot of people. And I think part of what the, the kind of current zeitgeist doesn't understand is the kind of power of that old fuddy-duddy thing called the law and government and systems. You know, maybe those things were a little too fashionable before, but I think they're a little too unfashionable now. And a lot of this peer-to-peer -peer stuff is great, but like, you know, a government saying 800,000 people are welcome or not welcome is big, heavy stuff. And I think if there's a blind spot in our consensus, it's about the power of the law and the power of these systems. Um, and there's a little too much faith, in my view, in self-regulation, which, which, you know, puts a lot of trust in fallible people. And so what's your recommendation to young leader from Saudi Arabia gets thrown into a company in India to try to help figure out where the government has failed the poor and the market has failed the poor to stand up for the poor in a system that is trying to bring some sort of capitalist yeah. solution because everything else has failed them. I mean, I think the, the really exciting thing about particularly not being a regular employee in that thing, but being this Acumen fellow going into this thing, you have the opportunity, I would imagine, to poke and question in a way that a regular employee off the street might be a little bit rude. Um, but you're, you're coming in from the outside for some reason. That, that's where we go back to the beginning of the outsider. Um, so in this situation where you're, you're thrown into a company in Hyderabad, um, I think it's worth thinking about what's that role of the outsider. Um, and to me, in this moment, it's, you're in a company, and, and, and companies are great, and companies do a lot of great for the world. Um, but it's being able to raise those questions about, you know, how do we do the core things we do? Um, a lot of companies, I mean, Starbucks had this great example where it was doing an, an extraordinary number of good stuff, and then it was exposed for scheduling people in a way that basically made it impossible for poor and working class people to have a life and made it impossible for them to have daycare for their kids. And you know, they were, their, their schedules were changing every week without any notice and they'd work you know, 7 a.m. one day and then it'd be changed. They worked, you know, and, and they couldn't plan a life. This was exposed and the CEO announced, now he's a particularly unusual CEO, he announced the next day he was changing it, right? Um, those kinds of things, I think, are this invisible layer that we don't talk about enough. And where maybe fellows, you know, it, it, so Starbucks was doing a, a bunch of great things before. It was sourcing well. It was serving the right coffee. It was providing health insurance. But in its core, the core thing of like, when do people show up for their job and how do they find out when and can they kind of get ahead in life? Um, it was pretty bad. And I think the opportunity for me when you're kind of flying in and spending a year is to be both respectful um, and a little bit of a thorn and question those things that people probably don't even see as being problematic. And um, when you think about your own ability to speak truth to power, often as an insider outsider, I, I look at Aspen. What is the price to you? What's been the hardest, the most painful price when you've actually spoken truth in a way that makes everybody go, go beyond a thorn uncomfortable? I mean, I think in each of these settings, um, there's sometimes a, I mean, I think the price is, to my mind, su you know, surprisingly, is less than you'd think. Um, I, you know, I think one of the great things about the world is people love the truth. Um, and people's capacity to hear truths that make them uncomfortable if they feel they have truth in them is one of the remarkable things about people. When you write and you put things out there constantly, I mean, I'm constantly writing things that, you know, someone or another is hurt, and, and people's capacity to bear that is an amazing human thing. Um, but, you know, in India, 
there were. Um, I mean, it's funny giving the you know talking what I'm talking about today. My book in India was criticized for being a pro-capitalism, pro-market celebration of you know the market's the capacity to change a, a very traditional calcified society, and it was sort of that. Um, and so there was a big you know kind of lefty criticism of me in India as being like a shill for um, you know I don't know the CIA or the World Economic Forum or whatever which is hard for you to imagine today but part of the in insider outsider thing is like those people see you like this and these people see you like that um, and I don't know for me it's the only way I know how to be um, you know I think it's like I had two accents when I was a kid I had like an accent from my parents that mimic their accent and then I had an accent for the world and school and then you know the hard moments where we're like when my parents had a like American friends come over and I had to like decide even though we're at home <laughs> do I do the home accent or do I do the away accent and then I remember there was like one dinner where I like decided to just go with the away accent as the full-time accent um, I mean I just think that's you know and, and again like those of you in this room a lot of people of you have different versions of that story um, to me that's like the normal way of, looking at the world that you're never, I feel like, I start to feel very uncomfortable when I'm just soaked in a particular world without an exit. Well, you're the journalist. I mean, I think that's part of what's really uncomfortable for being a fellow often, is you're by yourself in yeah. rural Bihar. There's really no exit um, until the end of the year, and then you realize that you actually do have an exit, but the people that you're leaving don't. And so I think mm. one of the themes that was really co connected to our fellows from your Aspen speech was privilege. That you weren't really talking just to the 1%. You were talking to, I mean, you have this great paragraph. If you live near Whole Foods, if you don't know someone who's a meth head, if there's no one in your family who's in the military, you may be part of the problem. How, how, did, how, did that, how did people respond to that? And what do you take away from that? What's the message? You're part of the problem. You're doing the best that you can. It may not feel like enough. I think, I think the idea is not that everybody needs to be perfect or can be perfect. I think the idea is simply to, and I was talking very much about myself. I mean, all, in that thing, like all the six things, they all applied to me, which is how I knew about them. Um, <laughs> and you know, I was thinking about how do you, I guess, I guess to step back, um, you said something about this earlier. I think the paradox that's interesting to me is, you know, I, I don't think this is by any means the most predatory elite we've ever had in history. I, I don't think it's, but it's pretty predatory. I don't think it's the most socially concerned elite we've had in history, but it's, but it's pretty off the charts socially concerned. But I do think this is, no, no elite more socially concerned has ever been so predatory at the same time. And no elite so predatory has ever been so socially concerned. And I think part of what is just weird about the world is whether it's a space like TED or McKinsey or Aspen or any of these worlds, which are elite spaces, they are all unquestionably more focused on issues of poverty, equity, and these things than they were in the 70s or 80s. Or 10 years ago. I mean, my dad worked for McKinsey in the 70s and 80s. I mean, I can guarantee you McKinsey did nothing, not one study on poverty in the 70s and 80s, right? And now McKinsey does all kinds of stuff on poverty, right? But it's hard to then think about how have all these elites become so socially concerned at the same time that the world has become vastly more inequitable. And no, I'm, I'm not thinking about the enormous growth. Um, How many people, of millions and of China, people have been moved out of poverty? But I'm talking about, particularly in this country, um, the quality of the American discourse on these issues is infinitely better than it was 30 years ago. But the numbers are much worse. So let me ask you probably an impossible question. If you look at, you, you've kind of gone back and forth between describing the global citizen, which is still elite. We travel around the world, we're home everywhere, nowhere, we have multiple identities, we are socially concerned, we have the tools and the education to actually do something about it. And then there, there's this predatory inequality that's also happening simultaneously. We're becoming equally more connected and more disconnected. So if we could think of four or five principles, moral principles for global citizenship that would help 
all individuals start to move along a path that would create a less predatory um, socially concerned elite, what, what might be some of them? Um, you know, I think one is this idea of, I think when we look at these issues, particularly these issues of, of equity, um, they're issues that somehow make us a lot more susceptible to ideology than fact finding. Hmm. Um, and I just think the, the thing number one I would say is, you know, I think we need to just get rid of all of our ideological blinders when we look at it. And the number, when you talk about these issues, whether it's on the right or the left, the, the stuff people will tell you, it just doesn't match reality in so many ways. Rising tide lifts all boats, or people on the left will say, like, you know, talking about family breakdown is inherently racist. There, there's just so much, there's so, there's so much bad, sloppy ideological thinking that I think screws up actual fact and observation and gathering about what is actually hmm bedeviling the lives of poor people. Um, so I'd say that's one. Um, I think another... Move beyond ideology. Yeah. Um, I think another is to, um, is to, instead of questioning the systems that benefit you last, question the systems that benefit you first. Um, and you know, if, if none of your ideas threaten your position, you probably don't have very good ideas. Um, it, you know, and, and it doesn't mean you have to like quit your life that day. I mean, the, the life is complicated. Um, and it's okay to be a person at Goldman who is doing their job and trying to do some good and wrestling with the duality of that. Um, but it's also okay to hold in your idea, the, uh, hold in your mind the idea that in a world that was, you know, arrayed better, maybe this job shouldn't exist. And I need to just sit with that. Um, and yet I need to feed my family, and yet, and yet. Um, so I think exploring arguments against interest um, as a real practice, place of truth. Um, and the third I'll say, and it's kind of related, um, I've been thinking a lot about, uh, <coughs> I feel everywhere in, in this many communities that talk a lot about this issue, and particularly elite gathering talk about this issue, the, the governing philosophy is kind of win-win-win. I call it win-win-winism. Um, and positivity is, is great. I like positivity. Um, but I think when it comes to a lot of these issues, a lot of the reason, you know, not all the reason, but a lot of the reason people live hard lives in a lot of places in the world is not just the failure of the penetration of this product or the failure of the market to reach here, or it's, it, it's not just some things that haven't happened yet. There is predation, you know, um, just to speak of India, which I know better than other places. You know, the reason a lot of people are living in poverty in India is because of other people in India. Mm -hmm. um, there's also other things, like we can get solar and this and that. But like, let's begin with the truth that India is sort of a recovering apartheid layer upon society layer upon layer upon. that has never been called an apartheid society, you know, and, and that you don't get over that fast. And that there are some people in the way of other people. And that's a win-lose. And I think in a lot of these circles, it's uncomfortable to talk about win-lose mm -hmm. and it's gauche and it's rude. And, and I understand the, the lure of positivity and you turn on CNN and there's so much negativity that you want to be an alternative to that. But I think people in these kind of roles going into these things, to sit with the idea that some of the hard lives people are living are win-lose situations. And the role of speaking truth in those situations is identifying who needs to lose and helping them lose. Um, and, and that's very hard. And I wonder if there's a possibility of understanding the asymmetry of power. Yeah. Who holds it and can truth be articulated in the face of that asymmetry? Yeah. And, and understanding that, um, that you know, our, our mutual friend Dele, who you know, is an amazing Nigerian journalist, um, we had a conversation once about, you know, do you believe this idea of progress? Um, and I think we all want to be hopeful people. And I think if you're, if you're, fi if you're bothering to fight poverty, like, you have to believe in progress. Um, but I think one of the difficult things when you look at the world is separating a kind of material progress, um, a progress, like we know that our 
computers will be better in 100 years than they are now. We know that. Um, they'll probably be inside us or whatever. Um, they already are yeah, inside exactly, us. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's scary. Um, we know that it'll be cheaper to get from point A to point B. Um, we know that we'll probably be able to educate a much larger number of people for less money than, you know, so there's certain things where we just know history does clearly move and the future is always better than the past. Um, things that involve the human heart, I think there's actually often less progress. Mm -hmm. we, don't, it's, we don't like to say, we look at Hungary right now, right? Um, it is extraordinary given the modern history of Hungary and given the time where it was Hungarians knocking on other doors within the lifetimes of a lot of these people who are still there. Um, and just other, actually every country in Europe right now, except Germany maybe, um, all of whom have either caused or you know, refugee crises or were refugees themselves and came in enormous numbers to this country and all the other countries. And you just see that stuff doesn't accrue. It doesn't add up. It doesn't stick. It's cyclical. Um, and I think that's in a way when I talk about the win-wins versus the win-loses. There's some things that are kind of in this win-win, progress marches, we always get better, Moore's law kind of applies to them. And there's a whole other set of things which are us. And I, I don't think we all we necessarily get better. And I don't think that's a problem. You can engineer around that, but you have to face that. Hmm. And I think that's very difficult in, in a lot of our communities, it's very, very difficult to face that with honesty. Anand, um, I have like 19,000 questions and I keep getting uh, the, the hook over there. <laughs> um, because I feel like we're just getting into the heart of this conversation and it's, um, you know, we're not very good about talking about love. Not even for self, nor for others, but we've, we seem to create it, we're starting to reflect ourselves into the world in the way that we would like to be seen and aren't doing enough listening, which you talked about, trying to understand the other and then coming up with these solutions across ideology. It is such an honor to just know you and uh, the way that you're fearless in, in, in speaking on the left side of your brain and the right side of your brain is a gift to all of us. Um, I didn't say before, but uh, we're really lucky that Anand joined our advisory council. I count you as a, a real friend and um, a teacher, and I thank you for all of it. The, um, the, the final thing I, I would just say is that Margot Alexander, one of our partners, has really been pushing us to think about language. And it's really easy in the world that you started describing, market-driven only, to think that a lot of the work that we do um, isn't good enough. Uh, but if you move it to the end of this conversation about honor, about community, about a different kind of human progress that is thicker mm. and takes longer to build, then you get to the heart of why we do the work that we do every day. And um, I thank you for honoring that. And I thank you for being here. And I know you're writing a book on inequality, and uh, we're all going to read it. But um, thank you for making our lives richer, really. Thank you. Congratulations to you all.